the chains are breaking we see your healing there's nothing like your presence yeah. the walls are falling the mountains moving there's nothing like your presence yeah. oh There's nothing like your presence Oh, oh, oh. There's nothing like your presence The chains are breaking See your healing There's nothing like Hallelujah. There is nothing like the presence of God. We are so, so glad that you're here. Welcome to the International Women of Faith Virtual Conference 2021. I am your host, Yvonne Gutora, and I'm honored to be joining you this morning. You are not here by accident. You had an appointment with 
God to be here long before you even knew it. And we are so glad that you took that time to, to, to be here so you can be a part of this amazing global conference. And I just want to acknowledge our sponsor for this morning, Zim Avian, out of Rua, Zimbabwe. They are a poultry breeder that provides the highest quality day poultry to the Zimbabwean community and around. So call them today because they are a reliable provider. Before we get started, I just want to make sure that we get to know who is joining us. Please rename yourself. Make sure you have your first name, your last name, and the country that you're joining us from. If you're in the United States, that's your first name, last name, and your state, the abbreviations, and USA. If you're joining us from outside the country, please, your first name, last name, and the country that you're joining us from. We had so many countries represented here yesterday. Uh, it was a lot, like Chad, we had people from uh, Mozambique joining, and we want to know who else is joining us and what other uh, na nations are represented here this morning. Uh, and if you do that, we'll be able to acknowledge you later on. And if you are a man or woman of God, please let us know that by putting your title before your first and your last name. And we'll be so glad to honor you. We are so excited for this morning. This is our workshop session. We always have this workshop session on the morning of our second day, and we, we have a lot in store for you. Uh, one of the pillars of Women of Faith is empowerment. A woman of faith is a lifelong learner, and we always take time to, to get together and hear from subject experts. And this morning is no exception. We have three amazing presenters who have prepared a feast full of biblical-based information for us. Uh, our first session is about trusting God in the, in the storms of life, and that one is going to be led by Dr. Sanderson. Um, the second uh, workshop is going to be titled Wealth Building, and that is going to be led by Pastor MK. Uh, and the third workshop is Maintaining the Presence of God, and that one is going to be led to, uh, for us by Apostle Angie Lalambi. Uh, we, you're going to have an opportunity to, to select which one of those workshops you want to attend. I know we want to go to all of them, but unfortunately, we cannot. So you're going to select one. And don't worry, those instructions are going to come um, at the right time when we get there very soon. Uh, but before we start the workshops, we have a session prepared for us, backed by popular demand. Uh, I don't want to give this away, and uh, somebody's going to come to do the proper introduction. But ladies and gentlemen, just like last year, we started off this workshop session with a special treat. And in uh, for the first half hour, we're going to enjoy this uh, particular session. Uh, and then later on, we'll get to an opportunity to go to one of the three workshops that we're going to select. Um, but um, when the time comes, you get those instructions. Uh, I want to um, uh, introduce somebody very dear to us. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of introducing Reverend Peter Jiranyama, who is the senior pastor of Faith Tabernacle Christian Center in Southbury, Massachusetts. He is married to our uh, a lady reverend, Dr. Latina Jeranyama, for 29 precious years, and they have three amazing children. Uh, Doc, Re reverend Peter Jeranyama serves on the board of the International Healing Jesus Campaign in Ghana, and he's an associate professor in plant biology at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Ladies and gentlemen, help me to welcome Reverend Peter Jeranyama. Amen. Good, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. Uh, before we get underway, we want to come before the presence of the Lord. We want to get into a time of prayer. Shall we pray? Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you. What an awesome time. Uh, what a lovely time that we have in your presence. And we say, oh God, this morning, we are praying to the God 
uh, the God who can be felt, Jehovah Shammah. We ask that you may manifest your presence among us, uh, King of glory. Uh, we are praying to the God whose voice can be heard. Father, speak to us. We can hear your voice. Uh, King of glory, we ask that you may grant us the gifts of the Spirit because you are a God who gives the gifts of the Spirit and you are God who comes to our wildernesses. Uh, many of us are in wildernesses. Many of us are in solitary places and you visit us in our solitary places. Thank you, my God, that you are God who visits us even at our work. And I say, come to our work, oh God. Come into our business places. Come into our trade areas, our oh, King of glory. Thank you, and as we worship you this morning, you are God who speaks to us even as we worship you. You manifest your presence. We say be enthroned this morning uh, as we worship and as we glorify your name. Let your name be magnified and let your name be praised. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the living God. Um, it's my uh, singular honor uh, at this time uh, to introduce uh, the speaker this morning. Uh, I know Yvonne said we're going to have a treat for the next 30 plus minutes uh, before we break out into uh, various workshops. Uh, this, the speaker today, this morning, is a person that I've known uh, for more than 30 years. And our speaker today is uh, Pastor Milton Kangwendo. Uh, Pastor Milton Kangwendo <clears throat> is a workshop facilitator. He's a motivational speaker. He's a strategy uh, development consultant. He's a team building expert and he's an executive coach and an author. Uh, actually, I had the privilege to write a commendation to one of his three books. Um, Pastor Milton Kangwendo is an overseer at the Family Covenant Church in Harare. So when you're in Harare, please check him out. Uh, he's a pastor. He pastors a very vibrant church there. He's an accomplished uh, workshop facilitator, uh, and he's a strategy and a, uh, and a leadership development consultant, uh, and a motivational and a transformational uh, speaker and a team builder. Uh, in in 2003, Pastor Milton actually founded his own consultancy company uh, called the Innovate Consult. Consultoria, and uh, since that he has developed a lot of training workshops, he has facilitated staff uh, retreats, team building efforts, strategy and, and planning workshops, uh, transformational leadership. Uh, he has been invited uh, by various private companies uh, such as Old Mutual and a lot more, uh, and is involved in various government programs in helping team building and helping develop strategies for various ministries. Uh, and on the international scene, uh, he's involved with the uh, United Nations uh, programs. Uh, it, it, that's at multilateral levels. Uh, he's involved with various of their agencies. He has worked with UNDP, he has worked with FAO, um, and he's invited in various countries. He has done a lot of uh, these uh, programs in Africa, in various countries, in Ethiopia, Botswana, Ghana, you know, the list is endless. Even here in the US and in the UK, he has done these programs. Uh, but what I like about Pastor Milton, he's a family man. He's married uh, to Florence, a, a lady that I know, uh, and the couple is blessed with three children, uh, Mukundi, Munangi, and Muwaki, and I believe uh, his children are also on this platform this morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, receive my friend, Pastor Milton Kangwendo, MK. Well, thank you so much, uh, Pastor Professor Jirenyama. I am so excited and so thrilled and already blessed. I participated in yesterday's meetings and I was so so enriched and uh, special honor to Mangwenya, the very special lady, um, our very own first lady, uh, Pastor Letina Jiranyama. Thank you for obeying God and being able uh, to get this ministry. So excited and 
so thrilled to be here. Hey, and it's so good to see a number of my friends there. Good to see Pastor Kweku, Pastor Spongile Damasani, and to see all of you. And yes, I have just about 30 minutes in terms of building wealth in God's presence. And please, as we go along, hey, head to the chart and let's chart, post some question, post some item, and let's go together. And of course, if something really, 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 really works for you, hey, I would love to see that uh, uploads there. And of course, if something really does you good, it'll be great for us to see the thumbs up. And if something you really love it, it'll be nice to see the heart there. And of course, if something really makes you laugh, hey, it'll be great and delighted that I've got my friend, Reverend Sbanda with us, uh, Jem Sbanda. Oh, delighted. And of course, if something really gets you shocked, okay, uh, I'm hoping that uh, not many of us will be shocked, but hey, you know, and if something is a breakthrough idea for you, I'd love to see the tada. So let's get on with it and let's have fun in God's presence and land. So uh, let me start by sharing my screen so that it will be easy for me. Okay, that's great. Okay, I trust that you can see my screen. Uh, Lily, please confirm that you can see your screen and uh, let me see your reaction there. Can you see it? Oh, yes, I'm delighted. Sue can see it. Okay, that's great. So we've been talking about the presence of God, the presence of God. And that's the great theme of this uh, conference. And uh, you see, you can always build wealth wherever, perhaps. But hey, when you build it in the presence of God, amazing, it gives you so much leverage. Amazing. It gives you an unfair advantage. So what am I looking at? Hopefully that uh, you're going to get this afternoon, okay? Or rather this morning, depending on where you are, where I am, it's about afternoon. So how, what is your approach to wealth building, okay? And I know a number of us here have been working, perhaps some for five years, 10 years, 15 years, a number are in business or they have other ways in which they make money. And uh, But what is your approach and how do you deal with the limitations and barriers? And, and I am sure for a lot of us, you would agree that for most of us, you find that by the time you come to the end of the month, there is more month left than the amount that was in your paycheck when you began. Okay, so and then what are the stepping stones? So how do you step, you know, how do you start to move? And as well, you see, there are a lot of models that you can use, uh, modern models, models elsewhere. But today I want to share with you some very powerful time tested models that are there that amazingly when I started to see them my life was transformed and that's what you can see in the presence of the Lord and then how do you sustain momentum and what are the strategies that we can use and of course the critical mindsets and mind shifts that you need and uh, how and where do we do you start immediately and i'm sure that you don't want to get wealthy when you are 50, when you are 80 or when you are 100 or i don't know what age but you want to start your wealth machine right away okay so let's get on to it quickly Okay, a few things that I would like you to underline. This is best line. This we just have to underline. Okay, the first one, and was we talk to building wealth, the first thing is it is possible. It is possible. Because, you know, sometimes the situations where we live in, the situations that we are in, Perhaps it could be the country where you are. It could be your professional barriers. Sometimes it looks like it's impossible. But what I want you to do is to underline it and know that, yes, you can. Not only can you, the Bible says that there is one principle solution for the poor 
as the gospel preached to them. So the gospel gives us momentum. The gospel gives us the tools for you to be able to say, yes, I can. There is an alternative and I can do it. Number two is that it does not matter what the place and what the space is. Right there where you are, you can begin to create wealth. Perhaps in creating and building wealth, the biggest and most important space is the space between your two ears as opposed to your geography. Because a lot of people think that, you know, if I'm in Zimbabwe, maybe I cannot do it. Perhaps if I am in Boston, perhaps if I am in Fiji, perhaps uh, if I am in uh, South Africa or wherever. But what I want to tell you is where you are standing, where you are, as long as you have got God, you are an absolute majority. And throughout scripture, you have people that made wealth, that created wealth in seemingly impossible places. People that started out with just a bottle of oil and a staff that returned with much. People that were able when they cried to God like Esau and cried and said, do you have God only one blessing? They were so blessed that when they met their brother, they were able to say, my brother, I have enough. Don't worry. For you as well, you might have left with nothing. But let me tell you, when you come back in the next few years, in the next few moments, you will be able to come back and say, I have enough. So get ready to change your story. And here is something I want you to note, and I want you to note very well, is this, is that today is the poorest that you are ever going to be. Today as the poorest that you are ever going to be. Why? Because God never finds you in one place and leaves you at that place. He always takes you to where you never thought you'd go. Number three is that there is a purpose. There is a purpose. I know for some of us, we might be looking at it and say, hey, I have enough to feed my family. I have enough to send my kids to school. I have enough to look after my mother, my father. Yes, but you see the challenge that we have is a challenge of being a blessing to nations. And you cannot bless nations just out of your wallet. God wants to lift you, bless you, increase you in order for you to be truly a blessing. Okay, and number four is that there is a process and you can engage that process. Okay, so let's go to our case study because our book, our wolf book, our wolf manual for me is the word of God. So we're reading Genesis chapter 10 and I read verse six to 12. Okay, now very early in the Bible, we'll learn a case study of a man who began to build wealth. And so that's the guy we are going to learn from, and his name is Nimrod. So the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 10, and I read from verse 6, it says, And the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush were Sheba, Havila, Septan, Rama, and Septeca. And the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Now, when you read verse 7, you see something that's very exciting. So of the notable sons of Cush, Nimrod was not even there. He is not mentioned in verse 7. And, you know, let me tell you, uh, your name will be worth mentioning. After God is through with you, your name will be worth mentioning. Okay. Now in verse eight, the Bible says, and Cush beget Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. So even though you might look at your current world status, and you might be thinking, I'm so far, I am at the back of beyond. Let me tell you, today, is the beginning of days. If you already have traveled, you have gone so far, today is the day that you launch to the next level. Verse 10, it says, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, was Erech, was Akkad, was Kelna in the land of Kenya, and in 
verse 11, it says, and from that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, city Rehoboth or Rehoboth Er, and Kala and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, and that is the principal city. Hey, this already gets me so excited, so thrilled, and I am loving it, and I love uh, this scripture. So now, let's get into our case study, and let's look at it. Okay, now let's look at Nimrod's context, and as we look at Nimrod's context, I would like you to also look at your own context, okay? So let's go together. His position in the family, you know, when you look at verse seven, he is not even mentioned. Perhaps it was like, you know, and you might be looking at yourself and you might be saying, you know, my brother has achieved this, my, my sister has achieved this, my so-and-so has achieved this, and it doesn't look like there is a place for you. Let me tell you, you can begin from wherever you are. You can begin, even if you might look like you are in your back foot in terms of wealth, you can can begin. And look at his name. The name Nimrod means rebellion, or it means the valiant. So, you know, uh, when, when you look at it, when people normally look at the story of Nimrod, they say, wow, this man was a tyrant. He was the first one who began to enslave people. He is the first one who began to domesticate animals. And he is the first one who would force people into cities and all that. Hey, this man was rebellious. But what I want to tell you is that for you as well, if you're going to build wealth, you need this name of Nimrod. You need this character. Why? Because you have to get out of the social hypnosis. Perhaps some people have been told you cannot make it. You just have to rebel against that tag and against that label. You can make it. In other words, even if everyone in your situation appears like they are not making it, you can make it. You have to say, I will break free. I will break free from the force of gravity that wants to make me stay where I am. But again, we hear that Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one before the Lord. So there is a beginning and you can begin. In other words, you can make something happen. You can begin. And I like his profession. He was a hunter. A few moments now, we'll be talking about the hunter mentality. Okay, so now three important wealth building keys of Nimrod. The first one is the paradigm, the paradigm. And uh, because I'm in Africa and in some of the places where I do my workshops, you know, uh, they don't call it paradigm, they just call it paradigm. So paradigm is better than paradigm. So, you know, your paradigm is so powerful because you are either dug where you are or you are saying, Jesus, dig me from here. You know, your paradigm is so powerful. Your mindset, how is your mindset? Is it a mindset of wealth or a mindset of poverty? Number two, the power of process. In other words, you need a process because sometimes we look at something and we think that it will happen in a day. No, success happens, it may not happen in a day, but every day you can start to take one step at a time towards your great wealth. So never be disappointed with a dollar. If all that you have in your pocket today is one dollar, one US dollar, you have enough of a seed. You see, when you look at a seed, you see, is that when you look at a seed, you can count the number of seeds in uh, say in a fruit or in a plant, but what you cannot count is the number of plants that are inside the seed. You see, your seed has potential and your seed can take you places. And then number three is the power of platform or staging. Okay, so let's take those three. Remember the three, Apostle Angie, remember the three, paradigm, process, and platform. Hey, Go, let's go together. Hey, Pastor Patience, paradigm, process, and platform. So that's what we will talk about. Okay, so let's get on with it. Nancy, paradigm, process, and platform. Anna, paradigm, 
process and platform. So let's start with paradigm, with mindset. And what do we learn from Nimrod? What was his wealth building mindset? Okay, now, at the center of everything that Nimrod did is that it says that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. You know, he coveted, you know, it was like the presence of God, you know, knowing that whatever I do, I do before the Lord. But there are three key things for me that are important about Nimrod. The first one, the Bible says he was a mighty one. But, you know, normally when we put it in English and you say mighty one, you know, we don't get it. We can better get it if you put it this way. He was a mighty one. A mighty one, not a mighty one, but a mighty one. Because many a time, you know, sometimes you want to hang out with those that have, you know, poverty always needs company. You know, staying where you are is comfortable. It has got company. But you need to be able to say, I'm going to stand out, even if I have to stand alone. Because one thing that wealth building will do, it will make you find yourself in places where others are not, doing what others are not doing. And that mighty one, that ability to stand on your own and say, if I have to believe the word of God, I believe it, even if no one is doing it. If I have to take some Joseph of Armatia type of steps to sow, I'm going to do it even if no one is sowing it. In other words, building walls is not a democratic issue. It is an issue of one person beginning to say, I will hold on to God. I I will believe God and I'm going to launch my life and I'm going to be totally different. Number two is that he was a hunter. You see, a lot of people are expecting that wealth will come and hunt you, find you in your bedroom, take you and say, you are the anointed one to build wealth. It doesn't happen. You yourself, you have to wake up and say, I'm going to hunt, I'm going to hunt, I'm going to look for it, and I'm going to do whatever I need to do. You see, you cannot just sit there and expect that greatness will come. Greatness must be pursued. Even God loves to be pursued. You know, things will not just happen while you are sitting. You cannot lazy yourself to greatness. You have to say, I will hunt. I'm hunting. If somebody sees you, they can see that you are a hunter. You are in action. You are in motion. You are moving. You are engaged. And number three is that he was a mighty warrior and builder. So it wasn't just about hunting, but there was a process of storing it, a process of putting it together. So uh, when you look at uh, Nimrod's mindset, there were three things. The power of one, you know, it starts with one. It starts with one. So you see, wealth starts in the mind, but does not end there. Look at your thoughts. You see, you cannot build wealth when you have got poverty thoughts poverty mentality, when you're always complaining and thinking that you're, you know, you will not build wealth thinking like a victim. You can only start building wealth when it starts in the mind where you start to say, if I have to believe God for it, I will believe. If I have to fast for it, I shall fast. If I have to pray, I shall pray. Whatever I need to do, I'm going to do it. And wealth as determined by audience, you see. And you see, for, for, for Nimrod, amazingly, the Bible says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, you know. And so for you, what is your audience? See, I read something that just like touched me, and, uh, and I, I think it's so important. A lot of people spend money that they cannot afford, right? which is money that they don't have on people who do not care how you look or you don't look. Listen, no one is watching your status. No one is looking at your dress. No one is saying, you know what, have you done this? Did we see? So a lot of people waste money on things that they cannot afford and waste it using money that they don't own to get things that impress things that no one is looking. So look at your life and say, who is is my audience.
and I like it when you look at uh, at Nimrod. He was doing it before the Lord. You know, so look at your life and say, what informs me? And you know what? In world building, you have to play for the audience of one. Play to God. Play to the gallery of heaven. Play to the gallery of the heavens. And you know what? When you do that, it transforms your life. And lastly, about wealth, is that wealth is energy intensive. You know, you cannot lazy yourself to wealth. You can't just lazy yourself to wealth. It is energy intensive. You have to put your mind to it, hunt, go for it, and keep going. Okay. Hey, Pastor Rosanna, are we together? Uh, yes, I can see Yvonne. I like that smile. So let's go. Let's go, Yvonne, and let's go to Nimrod's world building process. Okay, so let's look at the world building process and then perhaps uh, uh, the, the world building platform, we can take it in, uh, in the... Um, uh, and in the breakout session. Okay, so the world building process is that it, it's a process of five Ps, okay? Now, the first one, is a process of plugging. So you have to plug yourself into a genealogy. You see, you have to plug yourself into a genealogy. Now, the second bit is that you have to adopt a process. And then number three is you have to own a field and own a playground, okay? And then number four is that you have to practice. And something that I loved yesterday that came from, um, uh, from, from Dr. Jazz is that practice makes permanent, okay? So, and then the fifth one, is the element of progress, progress, progress. Okay, so let me take the principle of plugging into a genealogy. You see, you know, when you look at uh, the Bible, you know, when you look at even the genealogy of Christ, not everyone in there was a Jew. Not everyone in there was a Jew. Not everyone in there deserved to be in there. But what grace does is it allows you to plug in where you could not plug in. And now, now when we look at the genealogy of wealth, uh, is that what you need to do is to be able to trust and uh, zip it into your DNA. Let me put it uh, uh, in, in the way that you would understand. You see, uh, Here's the way that the Bible puts it. You know, the Bible talks of a guy like Bezalel, you know, or Bezalel. That's how we grew up pronouncing it, you see. Now, here's what Bezalel did. You know, when you see him, he is the one of the designers. He was one of those who could work in gold. So look at your own area and say, where in the Bible can I plug into this genealogy? So plug into this genealogy Trace it in the scriptures, trace the promises, trace the people, and then even beyond the Bible. For instance, if you are like my friend Alan Gatora, who is a dentist, you know, say to yourself, hey, where do I plug in? You plug into the genealogy with Brother Luke, the Apostle Luke, and then you keep plugging. Where are those medical doctors who have a successful practice? Look for them. Plug into that genealogy. Read those books, plug in. Listen to their message, plug in. You know, if you are a pastor, look at those pastors that are producing results and start it from Genesis. Get on to Exodus. Keep going. Plug into Pastor Moses. Move in, move in. Plug into the genealogy. Look at who is producing the results plug into that genealogy. When you think like how wealthy people think, you start producing the results of those that also produce well. If you are in art, if you are in real estate, plug into the real estate owners. And they are there in the Bible. And in other words, find your genealogy, plug into it. Number two, the element of process. You see, put a process of becoming in place. So it starts with your habits. It starts with your routines. It starts with your vows. And here is a key that I want to leave with you is this. Try and think once and then spend the next five or 10 years doing it and living it and, and, and putting it. You see, for instance, you know, you find that even the redemption story, you 
God and he thinks once how he's going to do it and he even starts calling Jesus the lamb that was slain from the beginning of the world and then he thinks once and then he starts doing it and that's why the theologians then start to say Christ is in the Old Testament concealed and in the New Testament revealed so think once then work the revelation process other people may not see what you're doing how you're doing it but you are clear you are working a process now number three is the element of the play field and and for me the play field is great you see with nimrod the bible does not say that nimrod was a professor it doesn't say that nimrod was a medical doctor but it says nimrod found a niche and his niche was hunting and he says you know what i'm gonna hunt before god and as i hunt i will hunt domesticate the animals i hunt if i have to hunt people hunt everything but i am a hunter and that's why the bible says that it ended up even being a proverb like nimrod the mighty hunter before the lord i like something that um, uh, you know martin luther king jr said he said if a man is a street sweeper he must sweep the street in such a way that when he dies the whole street the whole city must turn up at his door and say here lies the greatest sweeper that never existed you see there are no half hearted champions anyway so in your life define your play field and say this is the area that i'm going to dominate i'm going to master and you know what that becomes your seed for your wealth building process but i want to i leave you with a special idea and perhaps a special prayer it is this is that you know what pray to god that by while you are in his presence while you are in this conference that you know what god can give you one single idea and out of that one single idea you're going to build wealth that can go through 10 or 20 generations now when you look at great businesses there is an idea that they thought if it is apple it is the intersection of technology and humanities right in there that is their niche that is their idea when you look at all the other businesses there is a single idea that if you can catch amazingly it can transform your life now some of you might have been to zimbabwe perhaps round about 2006 2007 when we had like the world breaking record of inflation one guy from america came to zimbabwe and said i have to come and witness how people live when their inflation is like uh, you know uh, 300,000%. So he came and one of the things that he observed is that you know what if you would find that people were getting into lifts and getting into lifts and then you know you say then you say to the person who was accompanying him was taking him around you say what are they doing he says they are catching the lifts how do you know where they are going you know and they say no you know if you're going anywhere to any of the cities you just stop you get into the lift the amount is so much hey let me tell you what happened just out of that one single idea this gentleman came back to the united states and didn't even think of far he just called his business lift and you know about lift in the us and it was born out of zimbabwe and guess what he did out of the one single idea he sold lift for more than a billion and started the next business guess what his next business was called it was called the zimright you know, here is a guy who's not even Zimbabwe starts Zim right out of the one idea. Here's my prayer. May God just open something in your heart, something in your spirit. May he give you some rhema, some rhema, something that you know what? It's a pearl of great price that you will be able to sell everything else and focus on it and go for it and put your energy into it.
No, so what is that one idea? And I've got like just about uh, two minutes before I go. Number four is that when you find that idea, when you find that pearl of bread price, practice, do it. It will work sometimes, it won't work sometimes, but keep going with it. And then number five is the element of progress. The progress is this, is that, you know, as we are saying with that, with the progress is, you know what? Um, is that, you know what, keep progressing, keep building on, keep sustaining the momentum, keep scaling up, and you know what, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, here is what I want, uh, which is my challenge. Go back to default settings. You see, if you are having a problem with your computer or with some gadgets, once in a while, you know, they say, you know, just do a hard reset and restore the thing to factory settings. And in your factory settings in Genesis, God gave a command to people and say, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Those are your default settings. Fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Hey, look around the world. Coca-Cola got one single idea that you can get some water put some chemicals in it, put some gas inside it, and they are fruitful, multiplying, filling the earth. So you yourself, go back to default settings. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the whole earth. I've got one minute to go. So one minute to go is to just say, um, now, the last is the world building platform and stages. So I'm going to cover this in the settings because this is, is totally transformative and totally powerful because on platform one is what do you do at the beginnings? And you find that when you trace how Nimrod was building, he started at Babel and, and Babel is about beginnings. And talking about Babel, when you read Genesis 11, it tells you that, you know, Babel is that place where he started and things got a little confused and it looked like things were ever going to be anything. But you know, when you start, things may look confused, but here's what we learn about Babel. At Babel, people say to go to, let us take brick, go to, let us take mortar, go, go to. You know what? There must be a spirit in you, which says the go to, let's get on with the go to, am I? I cannot sit here and only have my work uniforms be inherited, go to, let me take something, move with it and start doing something about it. And well, he also, he went platform one and then platform two. So in the workshop, I will now go through the mechanics on the platforms of how you actually do the world building process. So there is a bubble process, an Eric process, which is a marathon process, an Akkad process, which is a strategy process, a Kellner process, which is a risk management process. And then you go to the next step because you must never relax where you are. Go to the next step, to the Nineveh process. This is the positioning. The city Rehoboth, when God opens wide places for you, and then the Keller places, the vigor and sustaining energy process, and then the reason is the dynamic tension elements of it. Okay, so if you want to build wealth, remember, number one, your, yes, Mavis, let's go, your paradigm. Number two, your process. Lastly, your platform. Thank you and God bless you. And we will see you in the winner's circle. Continue to build great things in your life. God bless you. Wow, wow, wow. What an amazing session. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Pastor MK. I did Thank tell you. you guys we were in for a treat, didn't I? That was amazing. Thank you so much, Pastor MK. And I Thank hope you. you guys were taking notes because I was. I was writing down because, trust me, I would not want to try to remember what all the five P's stand for. So I wrote everything down and there was a lot to take back. Um, I, I mean, it, it totally transformed, I think, and I hope it transformed you too. Uh, hearing things like 
poverty needs company. I know we maybe we might have heard this before, but then I was trying to think like, who wants to keep the company of poverty? Not me. I'm moving. I'm going to find other company like wealth company. Amen. You know the greatest. Uh, you said the, the great greatness must be pursued. Greatness is not going to come wake you out of the bed and say, "Hey, I'm here." No, you got to get out of the bed, go find greatness, and you cannot be lazy. You cannot lazy yourself into wealth. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> that was amazing, Pastor MK. So you got to work hard to get into wealth. Um, I know a lot of us have reset the way we think just from hearing of what the man of God had to say for, uh, to us today. Uh, there was a lot. And I, you guys can tell that he had a lot in store. Pastor MK uh, has books. Please make sure you look for his uh, books and resources and purchase them and just dive into them. Because, I mean, this is just snippets of, of the amount of information that uh, Pastor MK has. Thank you so much, Pastor MK. We were thoroughly, thoroughly blessed this morning. Uh, so we are about to start our workshop um, session with three breakout sessions. And shortly, uh, Sharon is going to come and give us all those instructions of what to do and how to be able to get to those rooms. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever it's in afternoon and evening. Uh, thank you for joining us for this session. We're so excited. We have wonderful presenters lined up. Um, so just, uh, you know, you can follow, look at what's on the screen and also follow along so that you know where to go. Um, we're going to open up breakout rooms so that uh, we can have the three workshops running simultaneously. So um, if you would like to participate in the, um, the workshop titled Peace Be Still, Trusting Jesus Through the Storms of Life, uh, which is presented by Dr. Jessica Anderson, um, where you will learn practical strategies believers can use to build resilience and cope with the storms of life in a healthy way. If you would like to uh, participate in that workshop, just stay here. You don't have to press anything. Just sit back and relax. And then um, that, that workshop will get started um, once everybody has gone into the other rooms. And if you would like to uh, join um, maintaining the presence of God, which will be presented by Apostle Angie Dalami. Um, forgive me, Pastor Angie. That's Apostle Angie for butchering your name. Um, where you will learn the two dimensions of the presence of God, the visible and the invisible. Um, join room one. Okay, so you will have an option to either just stay you, or you can click join room one. Just do that if you'd like to go to that workshop. And then in room two, we will have building wealth so a continuation of what you just heard from um, Pastor Milton, um, where you will learn, get a little bit more in depth about how to approach wealth building, addressing limitations and barriers, including how, how and where to start immediately. So if you would like a deeper dive in that topic, click room two. So I'm just going to repeat these again. Um, for peace be still, trusting Jesus through the storms of life. Uh, stay here. Don't do anything. If you would like to attend maintaining the presence of God, join room one. Building wealth, join room two. Okay, so shortly, uh, we're going to open breakout rooms. Okay, <laughs> if you cannot uh, get in, just send a message in the chat and uh, the tech team will get you into the room that you want to get into. Okay, so shortly now we're about to um, open the breakout rooms and just click on those, okay? Thank you, enjoy.
Hello. Um, I think people are still pick selecting rooms, uh, but just wanted to welcome everybody to the session with Dr. Sanderson. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanderson, for uh, preparing this uh, session for us about how to weather the storms with Christ as our anchor. Thank you so much um, for taking the time to prepare. Dr. Sanderson is a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist with over 15 years of experience working with individuals, couples, and families in the greater Hartford, Connecticut community. Dr. Sanderson real specializes in a number of clinical issues, including trauma and PTSD, grief and loss, couple and family relationships, difficulties, depression and anxiety, life transitions, and understanding and, main, and managing difficult thoughts and emotions. She works with children, teens, and adults. So uh, anybody who's in the Connecticut area, you're privileged that you can be able to reach out to her easier than some of us can. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, and over to you, Dr. Sanderson. Thank you so much. And I just want to start by saying I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to Pastor Latina. I know that it takes so much. There's so much behind the scenes to put on a conference like this. And so we're just so blessed um, for everyone who's contributed to this. And um, so thank you. Um, my name, as I was introduced, I'm Dr. Jessica Sanderson, and I am a licensed counselor. I also work for a nonprofit in Connecticut called Urban Alliance, and Urban Alliance is actually a network of 100 churches, um, and my role, our role in, the, in it is to, we build capacity, we support their outreach ministries. Um, and my passion, though, as a counselor I, um, I love to learn, but what's been so exciting to me over the last 10 years is to really take everything that I learned in school, um, everything that I learned from the field of counseling and psychology and integrate a biblical worldview to overlay it all with scripture and God's truth. And I feel like when we work with people and when we're supporting them, that is the most powerful thing. And so I'm excited to be here today and to talk about the storms of life. Um, before I start, I do want to open in prayer and then we'll jump right in. Lord God, we're just so grateful. I'm grateful for every person who's here today who took time out of their busy schedule to be here, God, to be with you, to learn about you. And, and so we just right now, we invite you into this time, into this workshop. We know that um, we need a touch from you. And so I pray that each person here, whether they're in a storm or whether they will be in a storm, God, that you would minister to them through this workshop and through this time. And I just pray that every word that comes out of my mouth would be from you. And we pray that we pray in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So the storms of life. And my prayer here is just that whether you're here today and you're in a storm, or whether you're here today and you will be in a storm because we know that we live in a world that is broken and that whether you're in a storm or you will be in a storm that this blesses you. And I wanna start with John 16, 33. There Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you, may, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I love this. He's preparing them. So Jesus says this to his disciples right after he tells them, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. So he's preparing them, right? He's going to die. He's going to rise from the dead. And his disciples are going to face some real hardships. And he is preparing them for the storm. But this is God's word. And so he's also using it to prepare us for the storm and for hardship. And I love that he says, yes, things are going to be hard, but you can still have peace. And so that's what we want to talk about today. The storm can be raging all around us and we can still maintain God's peace. We can still have joy. Now I know for many people this last year 
has been very, very difficult. Um, there was a, a report that was recently put out by APA, the American Psychological Association. And what this report was looking at was stress. And what it found was 80%, and this was in America, 80% of people in the US said that over this last year, they face significant stress. And honestly, I wonder if that number is even higher, if that 80%, those were just the people who were being honest. So we know that this last year has been very stressful and life is filled with storms. We can expect to have storms and storms take all different forms. Maybe it's the loss of a job, sickness, new medical diagnosis. I want you to even reflect on your own life. What are the storms that you have faced over this last year? Sometimes it's relational. It can be betrayal. Uh, those of you who are parents, sometimes you end up in a situation with one of your kids that you just never imagined you would be in. Or maybe it's your marriage, right? There's distance between you and your spouse. Maybe there's tension, maybe an affair. And then there's death. Over this last year, so many people have lost loved ones. Storms come in all different shapes and sizes. And Jesus talked a good amount about storms during his ministry. Um, it's clear we should expect them. And it's also clear that we can have peace through the storm. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. And we're going to start, I want to look at a couple of stories, examples, parables in the Bible where Jesus talks about storms. And so I'm going to shift to share my screen. All right, so the first place I want to look is Matthew 7, the parable of the wise and the foolish builder. And probably many of you are familiar with this parable. And in this parable, there's two builders and each of them builds a house. So we have two builders and we have two houses. One is built on the rock and the other is built on the sand. And I love, you know, when it's sunny, when it's nice out, when things are going well in life, there's really not too much difference between these two houses. But the storm comes here, the storm comes and it tests the houses. And we know how this parable ends. The rock, the house built on the rock, and the rock is Jesus. The house built on the rock stands and the house built in the sand comes crashing down. And so this parable, it says the person who hears the words of Jesus and puts them into practice is like the house built on the rock, right? So what does this mean? It's the person who surrenders everything to Jesus, who loves Jesus more than anything and puts down any idols that they might be carrying on their heart so that they can take hold of Jesus. You think about it, the house clung to that foundation through the storm. And that foundation is what gave it strength and stability. And so the house that's built on the rock that clings to Jesus, that is the one that withstands the storm. And sometimes we wish that there weren't storms, but sometimes God actually uses storms. God uses storms to reveal our idols. We all have idols. We don't mean to, but idols are things that we hold on to sometimes in our hands, sometimes in our hearts. There are things we hold on to to meet needs that Jesus was meant to meet, right? Idols can be anything. It can be money. It can be people, people's opinions about you, comfort, even your physical appearance. And these are all things that can make us feel loved, wanted, important, secure. And storms have a way of revealing our idols. Because Jesus wants to be the thing. He is what should make us feel loved, wanted, important, and secure. And just like the house that was built on the sand, it took a storm to, it can take a storm to reveal that we are clinging to the wrong things. So storms are really an opportunity for us to evaluate our hearts. What do we love the most? What are we looking to, to meet those deeper needs? What are we serving? 
And it's an opportunity to make sure that the answer to each of those questions is Jesus. And then we cling to him with all of our might when we're in a storm. And I had a storm, I can imagine we've all had storms. I had a storm over this past year. And I remember having this awareness, I'm in a storm, and even thinking about this parable and thinking about scripture. And I had this sense like, I don't want to have an idol and I just want to cling to Jesus. And I remember being, having the thought like, Lord, am I holding onto you tightly enough? Am I trusting you enough? Do I have enough faith? Right. And it was, I just remember I was praying and he reminded me, he said, Jess, it's not your grasp on me that's going to protect you, that's going to help you to withstand the storm. He reminded me that his arms actually were holding me. And that's what would keep me safe. And so we cling to Jesus in the storm. We love him before everything else. But we rest in the knowledge that he is holding us. And that gives us peace. So we cling to Jesus through the storm and love him before all else. Our next story. So Peter walks on water. I love this story. So Jesus is walking on water and he invites Peter to join him. And what's amazing is Peter does, right? He gets up, he gets out of the boat. He takes a step on the water and miraculously, right? He doesn't sink. He stays above the surface. But there's a storm in this story too. And there's a storm and it says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink. And we know it says he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So what happened here? Peter got distracted by the storm and he shifted his focus, right? He was focused on Jesus and he shifted his focus to the wind. And it's so easy to be distracted by the storm, right? For our focus to veer from Jesus, to worry, to fear. I know myself, I am so good at coming up with planning out every worst case scenario. And we see here, right, Peter, it's Peter's shift in focus from Jesus to the wind, to the storm. That's what caused him to sink. And so during the storm, we need to focus on Jesus. We need to focus our mind, our heart, our spirit, all of ourselves, we focus right on Jesus. And when we become distracted, because like Peter, we are weak. And there will be times when we are distracted by the storm. We allow the Holy Spirit to refocus us on Jesus and his truth. His truth renews our mind. And when we remember who God is and how he loves us, when we focus on that, that gives us peace. And the third thing I want to share, this is not a story, it's not a, a parable, it's more of a, a concept. It's a concept. God as our refuge. I'm going to read Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. So because God is our refuge and our strength, and this is describing quite a storm, we will not fear. So what is a refuge? What is a refuge? A refuge is something, but in this case, when we look at this verse, it's someone who provides shelter and who provides safety from danger or trouble. And we know God is our refuge and we can take shelter in him, in his presence when the storm comes. And taking refuge in God, that gives us peace. So let's recap. When the storm comes and the storm will come, how do we have peace? 
we cling to Jesus through the storm and we love him more than anything. We focus on Jesus through the storm and we take refuge in Jesus through the storm. Now I wanna share with you, um, one of my first jobs was at a research hospital. And I was hired to be part of a research study. It was part of a team. And what we were wanting to learn about was relationships between parents and very young children. And when I say young children, they were 12 months old. They were very young, they were infants. And to understand the relationship between a parent and a child, we had questionnaires, we had all different things that we would do, but one of them I remember, it was called the strange situation. And we created a strange situation. It was a situation that would create some stress for the child. And then we would watch what happened when the parent came to help the child. So how this worked, the parent and the child, so they're in our office. This is a strange, a strange place for that, that 12 month old. And we sat the child on the floor and we gave them some toys and the, usually it was the mom and her baby, they were sitting and playing together. And then we would ask the parent to step out of the room just for a moment, just for a minute or two, leaving the child alone to play. And so in a small way, what we were doing, we were creating a storm, right? For this 12 month old child. And as young as 12 months, one of the things that was fascinating to me, children and parents developed patterns, ways of relating to one another in all different types of situations, but they had ways that they related and interacted when the child was distressed. And what's interesting, um, and as we obviously don't have time today to go into all of this, what we found is there were four distinct patterns, four types of relationships. Um, and there was one of those four, one group of children that ended up being more resilient. They had better outcomes than the rest. These children were considered what we would call securely attached to their parent. And if I were, so there's tons of research on parent-child relationships, but if I were to follow, so these 12 month old, the ones that were securely attached to their parent, and I followed them, let's say I followed them for the rest of their life. I would see that they did better in school. They had more enduring relationships, better mental health, healthier marriages. There would be these positive outcomes. We could say these children were more resilient. Um, and so the mark, you know, how could you tell if, if a child had this secure attachment relationship? Now I'm simplifying all of this. It's a little bit more complex, but simply put, you would watch what happened when the parent came back in the room when that child was distressed, right? They might be sitting on the ground. Remember, we took the, the parent out of the room. They're alone playing with the toys and maybe, maybe they're alone and they start to cry or they get a little bit upset. But when the parent walked back into the room, there would be three things that we would see. First, they would focus. They would lock in on the parent. They would look right at the parent, so they'd focus. And then they would reach up their arms. They would reach up their arms and say, mom, dad, whoever came in, I want you right now more than anyone. They would reach up because they wanted to cling. They wanted to hold on to that parent. And then the parent would respond and they'd pick up that child and the child would sit often in their lap and they would take refuge in the parent and they would not just sit with the parent, but because that interaction allowed the child to receive comfort. They received comfort in their parent's presence. And in the same way, when we are in a storm, we are very much like that child in our Abba Father. See, God is a parent to us. In our Abba Father, he invites us to do the very same thing. We can choose to focus on him, to reach for him, to take hold of him and to take refuge in him and receive comfort. And when we are in a storm, that gives peace. Now I wanna talk about storms and loss. 
because anytime there's a storm, there is loss. And what is what is loss? Simply put, loss occurs anytime anything in life changes. Um, loss occurs often when we're experiencing stress. Loss occurs when there's trauma, when there's crisis. There's all kinds of losses. And so I'm curious, I'm gonna actually stop sharing the screen. I would love just to take a minute. And if people would put in the chat, I love some examples of loss, just anything that comes to your mind. It might be something that you've experienced. It might be something that you've seen someone else experience. What are some examples of loss? Divorce. Divorce is a great example. That is a loss of a relationship. If there's children, it's an entirely different, um, different way ebb and flow to life. Death, the loss of a job. Keep going. What are some other examples of loss? Loss of opportunities. That's a great one. Um, opportunities. Sometimes it's even hopes and dreams that we had that maybe they're not happening. Loss of a friendship. Absolutely, loss of relationships in all different forms. Maybe it's because of betrayal. Maybe it's a friend that moved and you don't see them as much. Loss of loved ones. Absolutely, loss of faith. That's a really good, that's a good example, loss of faith. And sometimes we become disillusioned. We become, um, sometimes people even feel hurt by God. Anything else? It's all different examples. Loss can take all different forms. Um, one of the things that's interesting is often we think of when we, when we think about loss, we think about negative things, right? Like things that would cause um, pain. But what's interesting, there's really loss in any change. And so let's think of something um, positive, like the birth of a child, which life is a blessing and it's a blessing to have a child um, and it's celebrated. And there are so many wonderful things in having a child, but for the mother and for the father, there are losses and often they're, they're um, unacknowledged. For example, parents lose time together. They lose sleep. They lose freedom. The woman, she might have physical changes to her body, changes in her schedule, changes in working, and these all reflect losses. I'm gonna go back to slides. And grief is a healthy response to loss. Grief helps people to process loss. And when we grieve, what we're doing is we're expressing our emotions. We're expressing our heart about whatever it is that was lost. lost. And often we think of grief just as an emotion, but grief impacts us it's a, it's a holistic experience. Grief impacts our emotions, our thoughts, our bodies. Grief can even impact us spiritually. And it helps us to process the loss, but sometimes losses are not acknowledged. And this is really important because when losses aren't acknowledged, they aren't grieved and we're not able to work through them and process them in a healthy way. Let's share video. Just a fun video.
painful to watch at the end, right? As that balloon is getting bigger and bigger and you know the pressure is building and a balloon has but so much capacity before it bursts. And we are like that balloon, right? And I want you to imagine every breath of air that goes into that balloon is like the troubles of life, right? It's the storms, the troubles, the pain, all of the difficult experiences that we have. And as more and more goes into the balloon, right? We experience more and more, the pressure builds. Now this is where grief comes in. I want you to imagine grief is like letting some air out of the balloon. It releases some of the pressure. Um, but all too often, if we don't acknowledge loss and we don't grieve it, like the balloon, pressure builds and people pop. It comes in all different, in different forms, but we need to grieve and acknowledge our losses. So some reflection questions. And for you to consider for yourself, are you able to easily identify the losses that you've experienced over the last year? It would literally, it would be impossible to go through a year without experiencing any loss. So when I ask that question, do they easily come to your mind? And how comfortable are you acknowledging these losses and expressing grief? Because sometimes we can acknowledge losses, but the emotional part of that process is uncomfortable. So this is just a time for you to reflect how you are personally interacting with some of these different concepts. Now there's also what's called ambiguous loss. And this is really important because this is a type of loss that often does not get acknowledged. So ambiguous loss is loss that occurs without closure or understanding. This kind of loss leaves a person searching for answers, which often complicates the grieving process. Examples, and these are just examples. This is not an exhaustive list. Examples of ambiguous loss include things like infertility, incarceration, a missing person, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia, right? Where the person physically, they are still with you but their mind is, there's a way that you're losing them even though they're still physically with you. Mental illness is the same. Miscarriage, adoption, immigration, a family serving in the military where they're still alive, but you don't have proximity to them. The death of an ex-spouse. These are all losses that often it's hard sometimes to openly acknowledge and get the support that's needed. And so we have what's called disenfranchised grief. And this occurs when the grief that a person experiences, often because the loss is an ambiguous loss, it comes from a loss that cannot be openly acknowledged, publicly mourned, or socially supported. And so this is what you're experiencing, I want to give a name to it. And I want you to encourage you to really acknowledge it and allow yourself to feel and express whatever it is you need to so that you can process it. Jesus modeled grief for us. I love when Lazarus dies, his friend Lazarus dies and we know he comes after Lazarus has been dead for some time and he approaches Mary and Martha. The Bible says, John 11, Jesus wept. Now Jesus, he knew he was gonna raise Lazarus from the dead, right? He knew in a moment, Lazarus is going to live. Yet he saw the people mourning. He saw their pain. And he had compassion and he was moved by their pain. And he didn't look at them in their grief. And he didn't say, pull it together. Trust God. Where's your faith? He came near and he wept with them. Jesus was fully God 
He never sinned and he wept. He had a, he felt a freedom to express his emotions, even the painful ones. And we should feel that freedom too. Now, there's, there's all different ways that we can pray to God and express ourselves. It's funny, on Thursday, just a couple of days ago, um, I gave a prayer on a, a training on intercession, but we can praise God, we can confess, we can pray and give thanksgiving. Um, but lament is a type of prayer that often I think does not get enough attention. And lament is a prayer for help from God born out of pain. It is pouring our pain out to God in prayer and at the same time remembering his faithfulness. And it exemplifies, I love it, it's the complexity of human emotion, right? Because expressing pain doesn't mean that we lack joy or we lack faith. We can simultaneously express deep pain and sorrow and have faith and joy and trust in God. And I think that's some of what we see in the Psalms and in different places in the Bible where people lament. So let's look at some examples of lament. This is a, these are examples of grieving. Hannah is a great example of lament and expressing grief. Right? Hannah was in distress. She was distraught because she could not conceive. And lament is not a prayer often that's put together and neat. It's often messy and raw and vulnerable. And we see Hannah was so distraught, right, that when she's praying at the temple, Eli actually thinks that she's drunk, that she's been drinking. Or David here. I love this, Psalm 142, and it's this great example of being honest with his feelings, but also recognizing who God is. Psalm 142, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him, I tell my troubles. We hear David, he's being very honest. He's telling God exactly how he feels. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry out to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather around me because of your goodness to me. This is an example of lament. He's telling God, he says, I pour out my complaint to you, Lord. And yet he remembers who God is. And so we can be honest in the same way when we experience a loss, when we are in a storm, we can lament and tell God exactly how we feel and also remember who God is. And as we pour out our pain to God, there is a supernatural exchange that happens. I love this verse, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received. And so he is the God of all comfort. And as we pour out our pain to him, as we lament, as we grieve, he pours out his comfort into us. And it's not just comfort that he gives us, but he gives us peace and love and rest and joy and strength, right? As we grieve and share our pain with him, he fills us with himself. And comfort is not just a concept. Comfort is really important when we talk about storms. And I believe comfort and peace, they're connected to one another. Not just a concept. Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Yeah, I love those words, taste and see, because sometimes with our faith, we, we intellectualize things. They're things that we are, we're understanding in our mind, but taste and see, those are experiences. And so I believe these things, and we're talking about comfort today. God wants that to be real for you. He wants it to be something that you don't just intellectualize the Bible verse, but that you experience because you are in his presence. And so that's a question. Have you tasted God's comfort? And God comforts us, I love, by his presence. God's presence, just like in the beginning when we talked about the parent walking into the room of the child who has been alone, the parent's presence gives comfort to the child. And our Abba Father, his presence, his nearness to us, that gives us comfort. And I'm curious for you, what does that mean to you? How have you experienced it? What's an image with you and whether it's Jesus or Abba Father? What's a way that you can even think about or visualize the two of you together that gives comfort? Maybe it's Jesus holding you. Maybe it's God sitting next to you, taking your hand. I don't know what it is, but God's presence gives comfort. And what does that mean to you? God also comforts us by his truth. God has given us his word and his truth about who he is, that we're going to spend eternity with him in heaven, that he's sovereign over every situation in our lives. That gives comfort. And so what's one truth? You know, there's all truth gives comfort, but for each person in certain situations that they're in, there are particular truths in God's word that the Holy Spirit wants to bring to your mind, because in this moment right now, you need to know that truth. So what's one truth right now that you need to remember that brings you comfort? And God also, I love this verse, God comforts us through other people. When he, God pours out his comfort into our life when we're struggling. And it's not just for us. He comforts us so then he can use us to help others who are struggling. And so do you have a person in your life that God uses to comfort you? And who is that? And if not, pray for one. Ask God, God, would you give me a person? to come alongside and give me support and encouragement and comfort because we see from this verse, that is God's desire, right? For us to be in relationship, in fellowship with one another where we're using our gifts to bless each other. So God gives us his comfort. Now we're gonna look at oops, Warden's tasks of grief. So let's put all of this together. Right, so this is a framework. This is a way of understanding the process that a person goes through some of the different tasks uh, when we experience loss. And remember, loss takes all different forms. And so we said, one, to accept the reality of the loss, this is we have to acknowledge the loss. We're not gonna grieve something in a healthy way that we haven't acknowledged. So first to acknowledge it to speak it, to put words to whatever that loss is. Next, experience the pain of grief. That is to grieve, to mourn. As we were talking a moment ago, to lament, to pour out your pain to God. And then we adjust to an environment without the person or whatever was lost. We adjust and we invest in a new reality. We figure out how do we keep moving forward in a way um, where we've experienced some healing. And this is what happens as we pour out our pain to God and he fills us with his comfort and his peace and his joy. And in that, that exchange, we experience healing. So we want to walk through each of these tasks of grief and we do not want to do it alone. We want to do it with one another and with the Lord. The devil loves when you isolate yourself, when you're struggling, because he knows then you are vulnerable and you're not going to enjoy the fellowship and the support of other people. 
So I encourage you to acknowledge what you're struggling with and pray that God would put a couple of people in your life that can walk with you and support you. I've got one more story about a storm. Okay, so Jesus calms the storm. I'm gonna read this. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat. So it was nearly swamped. So this was a, a serious, very significant storm. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and they said, teacher, don't you care if we drowned? And Jesus, he got up. He rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, peace, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And his disciples, and he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you have no faith? And they were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obeyed him. I love this story because we're talking about storms and we know we all experience storms and maybe right now you are experiencing a storm and Jesus is the one who calms the storm, right? He is sovereign, he is in control and that gives us peace. And he is the one, he can calm the storm in our situations, right? Because sometimes the storm is outside of us. It's these things that are happening in our lives that are stressful, they're difficult, they're painful. And Jesus is the one who can calm the storm. But sometimes the storm is in our hearts, right? It's not just outside of us, it's inside of us. And Jesus is the one who gives peace and gives comfort and gives joy. And he calms the storm in our hearts. However, when I, when I read this story, I so closely identify with the disciples, right? They're watching the wind and the waves crash around them, crashing not just around them, but throwing the boat in the water. And they look at Jesus and he's sleeping, right? And they feel, maybe they feel frustrated. Maybe they feel a little hurt. See, Jesus doesn't always stop the storm as quickly as we want him to. And I wonder if that's some of what the disciples felt. Maybe they felt confused. Maybe they felt hurt. And so I want to share a personal story. When my children were very young, so this was um, a decade ago, I had a storm in my life. And it really it felt like it wasn't just one storm. It was three. And they all came at the very same Time. There were these three very difficult, very painful situations. And it's kind of like it felt like one in each area of my life. And they all came, um, interestingly, at the exact same time. And I was overwhelmed. I remember my kids were one in three, which probably made it even harder because I had two very young children. And I remember um, just being so overwhelmed with my situation. And I put them to bed at night. And I remember every night for a year, I just wept. I just, I got to the end of the day. I put them to bed. I sat with the Lord and I wept. And I remember thinking the verse when it says about Jesus, a bruised reed, he will not break. And that just kept coming to mind. And I felt like God was breaking me. I remember I would just pray, Lord, just don't break me. And if I was at a conference like this and someone shared a Bible story about Jesus calming the storm, I have to be honest, I would have felt a certain way because he hadn't calmed my storm, right? I resonate with the disciples in the boat the moment before Jesus wakes up, seeing the storm and feeling hurt. I felt so hurt that God hadn't calmed my storm. And I share that 
because that might be what some of you today are feeling. You might have storms in your life and you don't understand them and you can't make sense of them and they cause pain and you don't understand if Jesus is sovereign, why isn't he stopping the storm for me? And so I want to end by saying, take heart. Because if Jesus hasn't stopped the storm, if he hasn't stood up and said, peace be still to that storm, there is something so very important and very intentional and of eternal value that he's doing through the storm. Because we see Jesus uses storms sometimes in ways that in the moment we don't understand and we can't always and I don't know exactly what that is for you, but I do promise you that he is working it. He's using it for your good, even if you can't see it and even if you don't understand it. And I have seen that personally in my own life. But more importantly, that's what scripture tells us. This is a hard scripture, but consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, right? Storms develop perseverance. They make us stronger and let perseverance finish its work so that you may become mature and complete, not lacking anything. God uses storms to make us mature and complete and to make us more like him. And Romans 8, 28 says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So even if we can't see it, even if we don't understand it, God is working for your good through the storm. I also wanted to share, um, so there's some handouts and I believe I'm not going, to, we're not going to email them to you, but I'm going to show you a website where you can Sorry about that. Let me try one more time. All right, here we go. So this is a website that we put together through my job at Urban Alliance and it highlights in Connecticut Christian care and counseling but I, what I want to show you, because you can access this no matter where you are, we have resources. And there are resources on all different topics uh, related to emotional health. We have addiction, Alzheimer's, dementia, crisis and trauma, depression, fear and anxiety, forgiveness, grief and loss, marriage. And they're all written um, from a Christian perspective. They're all written both to know if you're struggling with this, what's helpful for you to know very practically, but also what does the word of God say about these topics? And so the website you see right here, charisnetworkct.org, and the PDFs are all online and so you can access any of them. All right, we have about 10 minutes left. And so we wanted to leave this last um, section of time if there are any questions that anyone has. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanderson. Um, if anybody has a question, please uh, just enter it in the chat uh, so that we can uh, read it out to Dr. Sanderson to address. Okay, so while we're waiting for uh, some of the questions to come in, um, I just wanted to say just how profound this, you know, wealth of information that you shared with us was. I mean, I know um, 
you know, like one thing that you talked about was how to acknowledge, you know, what you're going through so you can be able to deal with it. Um, I really love the balloon video that you showed. Um, I, I was leaning back <laughs> when it was getting bigger and bigger because I knew what was going to happen. So like you said, you know, we, we have to learn to let some air out of that balloon, uh, which is ourselves when we're dealing with, with, with things in life so that we won't get to a place where, you know, where we can, where we pop. So, um, you know, thank you so much for giving us those like analogies and examples that can help us remember. So whenever we find ourselves in a storm, we can just imagine ourselves as that balloon so we can learn and know how to get started to let some of that stress out and start dealing with it. Uh, so uh, if anybody has a question, please do put it in the chat, um, but I can leave it up to you, Dr. Sanderson, to just, you know, uh, just continue and maybe give us uh, any other, uh, you know, pieces of information that you would like for us to, to um, hold on to while we're waiting for some questions. Sure. Um, I'm trying to think. It's funny. I had extra slides that I took out. I guess I should have kept them in. Um, one thing that I think is important that I didn't touch on is um, to how we can support one another through loss. And I think that's something that, you know, sometimes when someone is struggling, we feel like, and we all have good intentions, but we want to fix the situation or we want to do something that makes them feel better. And with loss, we can't fix it for another person. And we, we don't want to try to make them stop feeling what they're feeling because what they might need to do is be with someone and just be very sad or be very upset. And so one of the things I think that's really important, just the idea of just being um, a loving, compassionate presence with another person where your job, your role isn't to fix the situation because you can't. And it's not to even make the person necessarily feel better or stop feeling pain, but there is such power in just being with them. And so I think that's um, a really important um, concept when we talk about loss and, and grief. And sometimes it's hard um, because we have our own emotional reactions, right? If someone's upset and sometimes that even makes us feel upset. So it's learning to be um, just a safe presence and to be able to tolerate another person's pain. Um, I think that's a really important, um, just an important thing that I really didn't touch on. All right, there's a question. I hope, I hopefully this isn't too personal of a question, but I'm curious as to specific strategies that help you get through the overwhelming situation. Could you elaborate a little bit more? Sure, I would love to. Um, I mean, I would say there wasn't one particular strategy. I think for me, time with the Lord in his presence, and actually one thing that has been helpful to me, and I use this even in counseling, is having images, a way of, of thinking about myself and the Lord together and making it very real and very tangible. So for example, if I'm feeling sad and I, I'm feeling like I want to be embraced, just imagining being embraced by Jesus and closing my eyes and engaging in that. Um, I think taking the, for me, shifting things from a concept to a real experience has been very helpful. I think people um, building in a network of support. And I think this is one of the things that sometimes it's hard for us to receive from other people. Um, and it's not necessarily that other people don't want to help, but sometimes there is this tendency to want to be strong and perceived like you have it all together. And so I think a willingness to be, you know, a healthy vulnerability to share with people where you're struggling and to allow them to, to help you, whether that's through prayer or just listening or whatever it might be. 
and I do renewing my mind with God's truth is so important and being really intentional, you know, because when we're struggling, the devil, you know, he wants us to start believing his lies and he's diligent. He's strategic, right. About speaking lies that he knows that we're more susceptible to. So being particularly sensitive um, to my thoughts and really filtering them through truth and identifying those places where there's a lie and replacing them with truth. And, um, I do believe in speaking truth out loud. I think it's great just to have it in your mind and to think it, but there's something very powerful when we declare it and we speak it um, over ourselves and over our situation. So I would say those are um, some of the things that have been very helpful to me personally. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Sanderson. Um, you know, like what you just mentioned, um, you know, I, I know personally when I went through loss, but it's like 20 years ago, uh, the, the loss of my father, like I, I remember specifically uh, getting to a point where you are like out of all options. And then I just, you know, laying on the bed, imagine Jesus just holding me. So when you said that, it's almost like I had spoken to you, <laughs> you know, so it's like, you, you know, I guess the, the whole point is if you have a close relationship with Jesus and if you're walking with him daily, when all else is kind of breaking loose, that like you kind of feel like you have no, no one to go to, he has to be the person that you go to. And if he's the one you go to, you definitely will, um, you know, have that, whether you've heard it or not, to be able to imagine him holding your hand and walking you through whatever it is that you're going through. Uh, so thank you so much for making that practical for us. And, uh, you know, for all those that have gone through, I'm sure you've had different ways of coping. Um, you know, if, if you have other things that you would like to share as much as uh, what made what helped you to cope, you know, if, you, if you're able to share, please go ahead. Um, but I know like different people uh, go through different ways, but the most important thing is to acknowledge what's going on so you can be able to deal with it. Uh, no. just, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, one thing I didn't touch on with grief is that grief is a very normal process, right? And we all are going to grieve um, different losses. I will say I have seen a number of people, if grief is prolonged, like let's say it's um, one year, two years after the loss, and it feels like just the grief and the loss is still getting in the way of a person's day to day or really just deeply affecting them. Um, emotionally, I have seen a lot of people that do benefit from meeting with a counselor. And so I would just encourage people to get whatever help you need, whether it's talking to a friend, talking to a pastor, meeting with a counselor, um, to just embrace support. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, I'm reading some of the messages that I don't see questions yet. So I'll just read through uh, Siba said, thank you for helping us deal with loss. Uh, Vivian says, Jesus is needed. Time, uh, we need time to spend with Jesus, um, I believe. And then, uh, let me see. Uh, Samuel Zano says, I like the research you talked about. It gives one a practical example to see how one can deal with the storm. And I believe that's the example you gave about the infants uh, and how they responded when uh, the parents walked back through the door. Yes, that is very practical, uh, you know, in, in, in showing just how we should reach out to Jesus when we are in time of need of comfort and actually want to be comforted and receive the comfort. Uh, thank you so much for uh, participating, everybody. That was so good that we were engaged. And I, I know we're all paying attention so much. And Dr. Sanderson, you covered everything thoroughly that, you know, not so many people had questions, but we're just like taking it in and writing notes and literally just uh, uh, searching ourselves to see like, you know, are there areas that we haven't dealt with so we can be able to address those uh, so we have a lot of uh, homework. We have a lot of uh, time to just sit in, in, in quietness and just kind of search ourselves so we can deal with uh, this once and for all. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, I know we have 
uh, people are coming back in shortly. And as they're coming back in, it has been such an amazing workshop. I just want to thank everybody who was a part of this uh, workshop of how to weather the storms by clinging on to Jesus. And I uh, just want to give a special thank you to Dr. Sanderson for all this amazing material that you prepared for us. And um, just to point everybody to the website, it's um, charisnetworkct.org. That's C-H-A-R-I-S networkct.org. And she also mentioned that she's um, you know, working with the Urban Alliance as well. So check out that website and uh, you'll be able to find a lot of uh, material. I'm sure you know, emailing would, would not work because it's probably a lot of um, resources there. So just reach out. Uh, and then uh, we have it in the chat as well. And then she also did encourage us to, to seek counseling um, and to get help. So if you have, you know, you have your local pastors, please definitely reach out to them and they can also help us all walk through some of the life uh, challenges and difficulties. All right, so I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Sanderson, if you'd like to just say something in ending uh, just for a couple of minutes while we wait for everybody to come back in. Um, sure, well, can we close in prayer? Sure. We've got two more minutes. So first of all, just I wanna thank you again for having me. Uh, this is just such an important topic that it's gonna, we're all going to experience loss and storms. And let me close us in prayer. Lord God, we're just so grateful for this time. I'm grateful for each person who's here. And we're grateful, God, that your word helps us to prepare for storms. We know, God, in this world, you said we will have trouble. And we're so grateful that we can have your peace and your comfort, even while the storm is raging all around us. And so I pray for each person here. God, you know their life, you know their situation, you know storms that they're in right now, and you know storms that they will be in in the future because you go before us. And I just pray for each person that you help them to acknowledge the storm, to acknowledge the places, God, where they've experienced loss because we need to acknowledge it so we can grieve it. I pray just for a freedom for each person to express difficult, painful emotions. God, it's to grieve, to lament with you. And we pray comfort. I just, I pray comfort over every person here. You are the God of all comfort. And I pray God that we would taste and see that we would experience your comfort because it's not just a concept, it's real. I pray, God, that each person would experience your comfort, that they would just have encounters with you and that are supernatural, that aren't, um, we can't even understand there's mystery to it, God, but they would have encounters with you that give comfort and peace and strength and healing. And so we are just so grateful for you, Lord. We're so grateful that you're near for your presence and just for the way that you help us. And so we're grateful. We thank you, God. We love you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back. So good to be back together again. Uh, we had the most amazing three workshops that just came to a close and we have all been brought back into the same space. So I just want to just give a special thank you to all our subject matter uh, specialists and presenters uh, for taking the time out to speak to us and to really just dive into uh, the specific topics that we had. 
I wish I could have gone to all of them. I really do, but we cannot. So, I mean, we'll, we'll end up like missing out on a lot of stuff. So to be able to really get as much as we can, we had to split them up into three and then spend a good um, hour in each one. Uh, and, and I'm sure that was the best um, uh, setup that we we had. So uh, so that we can be able to see what was in the other sessions, we're going to do a, a recap. Uh, and and uh, we're fortunate enough to have Alan and Mavis who are going to join me and be able to recap with us uh, and share what was going on in the other sessions. That way you kind of get a little bit of the, uh, um, you know, the, the information, the bullet points that were uh, brought up in the other sessions. I, I know personally, I went to the one with Dr. Sanderson uh, of Weathering the Storms of Life uh, by Anchoring Onto Jesus. So I'm just gonna give a, a recap of that particular session. And then uh, we'll hear from the other uh, two uh, uh, friends of mine that are gonna come and uh, tell us a little bit about what we missed out on the other sessions. So with Dr. Sanderson, uh, we talked about, um, you know, like peace be still and trusting God through the storms. Uh, and she, she told us about how to focus on Jesus when you're going through life storms. So uh, the Bible told us that the storms are going to come. And I'm sure from experience, we've all seen that they do come. Um, you know, I'm sure when we're younger, we probably wonder, like, what storms are they talking about or what storms? And, you know, some some young children actually experience these storms when they're younger. But most of us, we had to wait till we get older. And then we're like, oh, OK, that's what they were talking about. The storms start coming. And then what do you do when the storms come? Um, so we were taught about how to seek refuge um, in, in Christ and how to um, walk with Christ. So number one was. Uh, you cling, you cling to Jesus. And number two was you focus on Jesus. And number three was you take refuge in Jesus. Uh, she gave us an example of infant children. Uh, there was a study that she was a part of, uh, which had infant children in a room. And then the parents, uh, or the parents step outside the room. And then while they're in there, if they're feeling some kind of distress. They, um, they uh, kind of like just wait until the, the family, the parents come back in the room and then they wait to see what happens. And when she was telling us about this, she, she, she mentioned how the first thing the child does when the door opens is like look towards the door and then they notice their parent and right away they uh, reach out to the parent. And then when the parent comes closer, they take them into their hands and they just like hug into them and just, takes refuge and comfort in them. So this example was just for us to visualize how we can get comfort in Jesus. So when, when Jesus is, is, he's always there. So when he is there, sometimes we see him, sometimes we don't because of what's going on in our minds. But if you feel the presence of Jesus, especially when you're going through something like, like a storm, you feel him even closer. So when you see him, the way it makes you feel when you reach out to him in prayer and in, in reading the Bible. Um, and then he talks to us. And then when he talks to us, he gives us comfort. So when he comforts us, we have to receive that comfort um, from him. And, and, and a good, great example that she gave was uh, something that I also experienced personally. It's like when you uh, need to be comforted through a loss and you have, no other really like tangible thing that you have, but to just envision Jesus holding you and hugging you. And you just stay there in his presence and then just take all that comfort in. And when we have been comforted and gone through a situation, that means we're now equipped to be able to give comfort to others. Uh, and then sometimes, I, and I really love what Dr. Sanderson said when she said, sometimes you can actually pray that God please send those people to me that I can provide comfort to. So, I mean, some, some situations, literally you find them uh, because of where you are. If you're walking, you know, in line with, uh, you know, the, the purposes of God, he will send you to people. You know, you'll find yourself in a situation somebody is going through and you're like, should I say something? And the answer is yes. Say something. You went through it for a reason. 
So now you're equipped and now you're ready to be able to reach out. I know it's not always easy to start saying something. You feel like I'm invading into somebody's space, but no, say something and let them also be able to receive uh, and, and benefit from your experience. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanderson. That was amazing. All right, thank you, Yvonne. And so I attended um, Pastor Milton as you saw in the first session that we had, he does not hold anything back. And I just wish we had more time with him just to dig in into uh, wealth building. And so he shared a few things, um, the two different platforms as he was enumerated as a case study. But a few things that I will highlight that he mentioned before I get onto the platforms was that the whole wealth building, it starts in the mind, okay? That's where it all starts. Once we get our mind, our thinking, in the right place or in the right wavelength, then we can go ahead and uh, proceed with the wealth building process. Um, some things they shared is who is in the address book? Okay, you won't go to the next level until you change uh, some people that are in the address book. Uh, you hang around people whose levels of success are beyond where you are, whose levels of success um, make you uncomfortable. So if you remain in a comfort zone, you won't be able to build wealth. You won't be able to go to the next level. Uh, he gives tips like travel, you know, read. He gave an example of, you know, if you have four cattle and you think you're doing mighty things and then you go to a ranch where someone has 2,000 cattle, then it, is, it should inspire you. So travel, do things like that. It will um, help you uh, become more healthy. It will help you grow um, in whatever field that you're in. And um, see, when you sit in business class, if you're flying, the other people that are in that business class, you won't find them in the coach. You won't find them in the economy. So it's all, in essence, putting yourself in a situation where you are uncomfortable, who, you know, give you an opportunity to meet other people who will inspire you to go to the level where you want to go to. And you also spoke about genealogy. I know you mentioned it uh, at the beginning of um, in the first session, but you kind of went back again, and it's always important of tracing your genealogy. Who can you serve while you are learning? Who can you plug into? And then you went into uh, discussing Nimrod um, world building strategy, and you talked about two different platforms. The first platform is uh, the beginnings platform. That's what you called it. And in this stage, you know you go through various changes. Uh, you at the beginning, you have no equipment. People may even laugh at you. You may look confused. You know, um, you just. He encourages us to have a dream that is so big, okay, that with what you have, it looks impossible. Have a dream so big that with what you have, it looks impossible. And dream based on faith, not on circumstance, okay? Dream based on faith, not on circumstance. And then you talked about uh, going into the marathon phase where uh, you stay the course um, as you try and build your wealth. And... Uh, take best lessons that you've learned from the past as you go into strategy. And um, then after that, go into the maturity. Uh, in this stage, ask questions, ask questions. Uh, people become successful as they ask the right questions. It's not so much about the answers that you give, but the questions that you ask. How inquisitive are you? Okay, that is part of uh, this stage at, at the beginning. And then as you go into the next phase, you, you, know, you learn how to manage risk. Okay, uh, how do you manage risk? You learn how to protect uh, yourself. You look at contracts and um, you know, this will make you a better business leader, a better uh, person as you try and um, you know, build your wealth. The next platform uh, that you mentioned is uh, the Next Step. That's what he called it, Next Step uh, platform. And um, you know, in his teachings he was using you know, Nimrod as he's building the different cities. And he says in Nineveh, you know, you have, it's all about positioning, okay? You've gone through the beginning phase. Now you have an idea of what you're doing. It's about positioning, okay? Now you notice people get to see what you're doing, who you are. It's all about positioning. And then you go into Rehoboth. And in Rehoboth now you have, you know, you are in room with wide places. You have a little bit of abundance. And, but still, you don't have to show it off, okay? You still have to, you can learn how to make money quietly, Deep waters are still sometimes, okay? You don't even make a lot of noise. A lot of people will fall into trouble, run into trouble in this phase where they make so much noise with the little that they've built. But he was encouraging us that when in this phase, 
you have to be okay with not showing off. And um, the next phase, you talked about um, the city of Kela, where you are in, you know, you're sustaining energy and you're working long hours as you continue to grow, you become more sophisticated as a business owner or as, as a leader in this, in this essence. And then you talked about um, the last one, uh, which, which I really touched me was uh, dynamic tension in the city of Raisin. And in this phase, he says, you have the ability to know how to deploy. You don't have to say yes to everything. You can say no to certain deals because you know that they don't align with uh, what you believe. So that was the city of Raisin. And some other things that he mentioned, um, which are important was you don't have to become God to everyone. That as you become successful, as you become wealthy, you know, the request will come along and you try and support everyone. But no, he said, don't be junior gods, okay? It's okay to say no. Um, and say the word no is as friendly and as spiritual as yes, okay? I think somebody has a question where, well, I'm the eldest, so I'm here in the US and I have support you know, so many people, you get requests coming, business proposals coming, it's okay to say no, okay? It's just as powerful and just as friendly as a spiritual and as a spiritual as, as a yes. And as you invest your money, um, invest from the top, not from the bottom. Don't invest from the leftovers. Make it a priority that if you have an idea and you're gonna go into it, you're gonna sow into it, don't invest what is left over after everything else has come through. Invest from the top, be committed to your idea. And, you know, you treat uh, your business um, as if you're an employee of it, okay? Don't say, okay, I see money coming in and you're just gonna take it whenever and, you know, spend it however. No, treat yourself like an employee of that business. And that way you'll be able to control yourselves. And he spoke of um, opportunities being everywhere. Uh, as you go into all building, as you try and start, um, you know, building a business, look at, what is available to you. There's so many opportunities, it's just that you don't see them. Like you mentioned the idea of Lyft and uh, Zimride, it all came from Zimbabwe. We all from, some people are from Zimbabwe that are here. We all use the same mode of transport, but nobody had that seen it. It took someone getting out of the comfort zone, going to another country, looking what is there. And from there, they were able to develop an idea. So is it going to build building, find your niche, Find that one thing. Let's pray to God to give you that one thing, that one idea that will help you break through. And once you start working on it, you'll notice that it's everywhere. Okay. And the last thing I think that I would like to mention is that um, he encouraged us, you know, uh, find mentors. You may have to pay for them. It's okay. But invest in yourself. Invest in yourself. If you see the value of yourself, you have to see the value of yourself first before someone else can value you. Okay, so invest in mentors, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. It was so much material. I just wish we had so, you know, more time with uh, Pastor MK. And uh, we just want to thank him for spending time with us, for coming back in this year and just empowering, you know, giving us, sorry, this, uh, this knowledge as uh, the woman of faith, one of the, you know, uh, you know, things they believe in, one of the pillars is uh, empowerment. And boy, we were empowered, empowered this morning by the wealth of information that uh, Pastor MK uh, gave to us this morning. So once again, thank you so much, um, Pastor Milton. And we look forward to, you know, getting more information from you. And uh, thank you for everything. And there was one other workshop that, um, you know, that was held this morning. I didn't attend. So I can't wait to hear what that one was about. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Yvonne. So the final workshop that we had uh, today was uh, following the theme that we have for the conference, which is uh, being in the presence of God. It was talking about maintaining the presence of God. And we're with Apostle Angie, Angie Dalambi. I can't say it. <laughs> Dr. Apostle Angie Dalambi. My apologies, Apostle. I'll just call you Apostle Angie so I don't keep butchering your name. But she started off by creating what I call a foundation for the conversation because she was talking about how sometimes our negative experiences and challenges can sometimes hinder the presence of God. She called them spiritual injuries, right? And she said these spiritual in injuries can compromise our relationship with God, whether those injuries came through negative experiences, those hurtful things that happened to us in the course of interacting with other uh, Christians or even sin, right? The choices and the decisions that we make 
ourselves. She also went into Matthew 6 as a specific example of one of the things that can hinder the presence of God, speaking to unforgiveness, the verse that if we don't forgive, God is not going to forgive. We, we skip over that verse a lot. Um, I'm not sure why it's not preached more because I believe like uh, Apostle uh, Angie was saying, it's paramount to how we relate with God. So if there's any type of unforgiveness in us, if there's any type of bitterness, if there's any type of holding on to negative things, we block the presence of God. So with that, she, she, she went into talking about some of the things that we can I consider when we're hearing or seeing the presence of God that the, he comes in different forms. He comes in different shapes. He, he comes in angels that are angels. He comes in angels that are in the form of men. He comes in flames. He comes in visions and dreams. He comes in different ways. He comes even in the voice of someone else, a child, a voice of a pastor, the voice. So there's a different ways that God manifests himself to us, right? The presence of God comes in different ways. And she want to make sure she emphasizes the fact that there's no experience just because you've seen an angel and someone else has, 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 has experienced the presence of God in a dream doesn't mean that your experience is better than the other person. So the presence of God experiences are the same no matter how God manifests. And she gave an example, which is a good one thing that Pastor uh, Apostle Angie was doing throughout was she was giving very practical example so you can immediately visualize what she was saying so for this particular one she gave the example of solomon and how he was promoted while he was asleep the dream when he he prayed in his dream and god answered it it didn't happen outside he wasn't walking in the street and an angel showed up but it was in his dream where promotion came so the experiences of god are the same no matter how god presents himself the other point that she mentioned as well was that the presence of God can be felt even in places where there's wickedness or where there's sin or where he is not invited. The example she shared there was when he wrote on the wall with the Tekel Tekel Mene, when the kings, uh, I think of Syria, were in the midst of their wickedness and he showed up in that way where the presence of God was felt. They felt it because they reacted to the presence of God. So the presence of God is not limited on when it will show up. So we're also supposed to expect that even in places where there's wickedness or where he's not invited, God will show up. And then he, she also mentioned the fact that the presence of God, he uses it for very specific different or very different reasons. He, he uses it to judge, he uses it to test, he uses it to assign, he uses it to promote, he uses it to strengthen. Uh, to warn, to challenge, to comfort, to protect. Um, and the example she gave with protecting was in the, in the experiences of Jesus when even the Magi or when, when Joseph was told in a dream to get up and leave immediately, that was God protecting his people in a dream using his presence. And then when she was done with the foundation, one of the final things she said, as long as you carry God's presence in you, he will fight for you as he did for Abraham when Abimelech, you will all remember when Abimelech took uh, Sarah from uh, Abraham, it was in a dream. Abimelech wasn't even a believer and God warned him not to touch Sarah because Abraham carried the presence of God with him. So God even fights for us with his presence, even when we are not there. So we are never to take the presence of God or the voice of God uh, for granted because she shared a testimony where she did in, in a personal testimony. And I'm not gonna go into that. I, I believe it, it will probably take a lot of time because it was really good. I probably wouldn't tell it the same way. But in essence, she said, never take the voice of God for granted because the penalty is too heavy. The penalty is too heavy. So the three things she wanted us to mainly take away about maintaining the presence of God were number one, the Holy Spirit is very crucial right? He is the presence of God. He is the voice of God, all right? So we have a need as believers to ensure that we are filled with the Holy Spirit or we'll tend to be religious. We will not be the, the, we'll not have the relationship that we're supposed to have because it is the Spirit of God in us that directs us and leads us in the way that he is. And he said, and she also mentioned that when, when God is absent, even as a preacher or a teacher of the word, when God is absent, who is there? What is left when God is not there? Where are you preaching from? How are you getting interpretation? So what spirit are you functioning under outside of the spirit of God? And she gave uh, the verses in that was 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, and also 1 Corinthians uh, 3 and 16. And the last thing she mentioned in here was do not quench 
the Holy Spirit. Right. And she mentioned different things that would quench the Holy Spirit. Unforgiveness keeps coming up. It's probably never going to go away because it's critical in the life of a Christian that we forgive. Right. She mentioned bitterness. She mentioned all kinds of sinful behavior that will quench the spirit of God. And then number two in the three things that we're supposed to take away was check your associations. And I, and I love the fact that this was echoed in the building your wealth as well as the people that you surround yourself with can literally block the presence of God. Who do you have around you? Um, are your associations diverting you from the presence of God? And in that, she went into Judges chapter 16 with Samson and Delilah. We all know the story. We all know what happened. But uh, Samson's uh, association with Delilah caused him the presence of God. The same thing is true of Solomon when he began to uh, go outside God's plan for him. I believe even in marrying some of the, the women that were outside of uh, where God had said to marry your, of your own, he began to lose the presence of God. And then last um, of the three things she said was obedience is needed to maintain the presence. Obedient is absolutely paramount when it comes to maintaining the presence of God. It's important to be obedient because it is better than sacrifice. We all know the verse that says that. So she also mentioned that we cannot seek God outside of his parameters. He's given us parameters for us to function him. And when we're outside of those, we cannot expect to find him because when we disobey and we go outside of what God has determined, he's not gonna follow us there, right? We are choosing to walk away from him, leaving his presence. and. She said disobedience is equal to witchcraft is equal to rebellion. And she used soul when he rejected, when he was rejected by God because of disobedience. So the three things again that we're to take away is that the Holy Spirit is very crucial, right? We are not to quench the spirit of God. Check your associations. Number two, make sure the people that are around you are not removing the presence of God or diverting you from the presence of God. And then lastly, obedience is needed to maintain the presence of God. So uh, we had a really um, amazing time just getting some of in, into some of those practical things about how can we begin to apply this in our day-to-day. -day. So I hope you took away something from that. We certainly did. It was not enough time. Apostle Angie, we could have definitely done more. And even with uh, her testimonies, which I'm sure one day you'll see. And for now, we'll go ahead and go into our ministry of giving. Amen. Hi, everyone. Uh, we thank God for today. I hope all of you will have a good night after Dr. Yes flamed the flame, the fire of transformation in God's presence. Uh, today, I'm going to lead you in the time of offering. We say offering is blessing time. It's time to be blessed by the Lord. God wants us to give givers, cheerful givers. When you are giving to the Lord, you give cheerfully. As we are experiencing the joy in his presence in this conference, that joy is the same joy we are going to use as we are giving unto the Lord. Women of faith want to reach all the 40 plus countries represented today, but we cannot do it without you, your support. So we are asking if you can give, because we want to take this word of God's presence, to take the God's greatness, God's goodness, to take his glory to all the 40 countries. But we cannot do that without your giving. The Bible tells me in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of our Lord Jesus himself saying it is more blessed to give than to receive. There are blessings we get when we give. I am a testimony of giving. I have seen God's blessings in my giving when I give wholeheartedly. Because we have orphans, we have widows to give to support in different countries. So women of faith have different ways of giving. For all our international guests, we have paper. We, we give through paper, www.idwomenoffaith.org. I repeat, www.idwomenoffaith, 
www.keshap.org. We also have Keshap. Those who are going to use Keshap, you can Keshap to dollar sign ID Women of Faith or 508-353-4646. The number again is 508-353-4646. You can text to give. It's another way we use in Women of Faith. Text IWOF to 857-574-4921. The number again is 857-574-4921. We can also use Zell. Those who cannot use the other three, you can use Zell 508-353-4646. The number again is 508-353-4646. May God bless you as you give. Thank you all for giving. May the Lord bless you and bless the generations to come. I want to speak a blessing from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, that may you be blessed in the cities or countries you live in. May you be blessed your going and your coming. Everything you touch, may you be blessed in everything you touch, wherever you go. May the blessings of God be upon you. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. I glorify your name. I thank you, you are with us in this conference. We thank you, Lord, for all the giving. Father, we thank you for our offerings. You have given us and we are giving, oh God, to your people. Father, we thank you, Lord. Bless each and every one we have given today, even those who couldn't give but their hearts. Father, we're yearning to give. Father, bless them with jobs. Bless them with businesses. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for every offering we have received today that we put it in use for your kingdom. We give you all the glory to you. We give you all the adoration to you. For in Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Are you looking for affordable, high-quality poultry products? Look no further. Zim Avian, your one-stop poultry shop for day-old chicks, hatching eggs, table eggs, vaccines, chemicals, as well as feed. Place your order today. Thank you, thank you. I uh, just want to give us another extra special mention to our sponsor for this session, Zim Avian. 
out of Zimbabwe. Thank you for sponsoring this session. Visit their website and learn more about how you can purchase day-old chicks and more. That's www.zimavian.com. We appreciate you and God bless you and may he expand your business. Wow, what an amazing workshop session we just had today. Thank you everyone for being here, for participating. Thank you to our speakers for that amazing uh, presentation you just gave us. Um, I know we're going to be all searching for your resources that, and your in the websites and your um, websites that you have, so we can get some more information from you. We really thank God for you, uh, and I know that this just jump started our day off well. There is so much in store for the rest of the day. We're going to have um, another session at two p.m. and then we're going to have a seven p.m. session. You don't want to miss this. So I'm going to give you guys a challenge, right? When you come back please bring back one or two other people that you have shared this information for the for the work for the um, conference with make make them log in or have make them go to our uh, Facebook ID women of faith or the Instagram or YouTube so they can also watch uh, we don't want to just grow alone we want to grow together uh, Pastor MK talked about uh, the company that you keep you know if you're growing with with your fellow brothers and sisters, when you get together, you have more to talk about because you, you know, have more to reflect on. You're learning together and you're growing together. So make sure you reach out to some people and let them come here. Uh, thank you so much to our international guests. We welcome you. Uh, just, I want to acknowledge our pastors that are joining us. Uh, I know we've had some time to welcome some of you uh, on the other sessions, but I, I also want to just uh, welcome Pastor Joseph Larby, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, now it's now afternoon or evening uh, in some places of the earth. Pastor David, uh, Pastor Patience David, thank you for being here. We love you. We thank you. Lady Tina Amor, thank you for being here. Pastor Rayla Dice, thank you so much for being here. We love you and we miss you. Minister Stimbile, thank you. You're so dear to our hearts. Thank you for being here. And uh, Pastor Brenda Esau, thank you so much for joining us. We, are, we appreciate you being here. Pastor Ellen Chidi, we love you, Pastor Chidi. Thank you so much for being here. Pastor Cynthia Ama, we are so honored that you're here. And uh, we really, really appreciate you taking time to be here. Pastor Ivy Akote, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. We look forward to spending some more time with our men and women of God, when we are so honored that you took time to be here. Just wanna give a special shout out to some of the countries that are represented. If you are able to rename yourself, we can be able to acknowledge you. We have uh, Ireland in the house. Uh, we have United Emirates, Thank you, Yvonne. Um, as she was saying, we have some countries that logged on. We appreciate you. I see we have United Emirates that joined us. We have Ireland in the house. We appreciate you for joining us. We also have uh, Australia all the way from Sydney, Australia. We love you and appreciate you. As Yvonne stated, do not forget we have two more sessions to go. They have been powerful. For those of you that missed last night with Dr. Jazz, Mm -mm -mm. Make sure you log on to YouTube and re-watch that with a 2 p.m. session with Lady uh, Reverend Adelaide Howard Mills, Episcopal Sister, correctly. And then we have Apostle Tarika Smith tonight, and we have a celebration night. Uh, without wasting any much time, we'd like to turn it over for our closing prayer for this session. Amen, 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 and a big hallelujah, the highest praise to our God. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we stand in awe of your presence. We give you the honor and all the glory. What a packed day, blessed day you have given us. From the time we woke up, we woke up with great expectation 
And indeed, we are experiencing your power. We are experiencing your glory. We thank you for, for the, from the worship, the music that we are receiving and also in, in taking. We thank you for the workshops that were so enriching. Thank you for the word that came on how we can gather wealth. Thank you for taking us into the beginning in Genesis. And thank you for Pastor Milton for the wonderful work that was done. Thank you, Lord, for the enrichment through the workshops and uh, all the information that we have taken, we put it to use. Indeed, oh God, like we said last night, we still want to learn more from you. We still desire <clears throat> your power and your glory, your presence like Moses said. Therefore, Lord, even as we take these breaks, we are not leaving your presence. We continue to ponder on many things. You are such a powerful God, an enriching God, a God who guides us. You don't want us to live in poverty. You don't want us to die in with, because of ignorance. You want to give us all the abundance that you have put in store for us. Therefore, we pray for this break that you, in, you bless it. And also you prepare us, oh God, for the 2 p.m. session that is coming. Continue, Holy Spirit, to connect us around the globe. Indeed, we are a global village. And when we gather together in this Zoom, we feel your presence. Talk to us, oh God even those who are struggling at this time to get it. The Holy Spirit, we just surrender every heart, every soul to you. Every life belongs to you. For in you, Lord, we live. In you, we move. In you, we have our being. You are such a mighty God. Bless our president of our international women of faith, Pastor Latina Jeranyama and her husband the entire pastors and all who are gathering. We gather under the secret place of the Most High, knowing that after this conference, we will be in truly empowered to stand in this troubling world as giants in your kingdom. We exalt you, we honor you, we worship you, and we sing the highest hallelujah for you are our God. In Jesus' name. We pray, amen.